Tina, welcome back. If you're new, I'm a jazz guitarist from Berlin. I'm offering in-depth videos with analysis of jazz standards, how you can play them, how you can understand them. At the moment, I'm practicing this Chopaz etude. It's called Wine and Roses and you can find it in this book. And I'm going to go through the first 16 bars today. So as a guideline or as a red thread through the video, I'm going to use this chord shape which is a drop two voicing and which is going to reoccur through the whole chord melody arrangement in different variations and I'm going to come back to it. So it's just like really a drop two voicing one, five, flat seven, minor third, right? And we're going to see what we can do with this voicing. Let's start with the first bar. The first bar is the tonic. The tune is in F major. The first chord is F major. <laughs> This is a plain F major drop two voicing, but this one, if, we, if we're playing this voicing on another string and put our finger here, we already encounter that shape and that's an A minor 7. Many jazz musicians play chords on the third of the degree as sort of an upper structure voicing. The third of the F major is an A and on the A is the A minor 7, right? If we move the 5 to the 4, it's an A minor 7, 11. And if we analyze that chord to the F because we are still in F, we have the Three, six, nine, five. So it's giving us a F six nine chord. The six nine chord and the major chord is pretty much interchangeable, and so this is good news because it means if you have been practicing, you drop two voicings, you could use any minor seven chord voicing. For example, this one. This is another drop two voicing, and then just move the five to the four which would be an A minus 7, 11 again, right? But with the root of the F, we have again 9, 6, uh, sorry, 9, 5, 6, 3rd. And this is another example of a drop 2 voicing. And if we lower the 5 to the 4, we get that shape. Also an A minus 7, 11 chord and it has many different uses. Have the F in the bass. It's again 6, 3, 5, 9. So that's really very interesting what you can do with one chord. So if you have a look at the chords of Days of Wine and Roses in the second bar, most of the time you have the E flat 7. But what we find here is a C minor triad. I guess you know the triad, if you just shift it here, it's the famous A minor triad and here it's just C, right? That's the A, that's the C. And I really wondered how does that chord get there and I did some research and I found that in the original version of the tune, it's a tune written by Henry Mancini, there's actually a C minor slash E flat, a C minor triad with an E flat in the bass. So if we analyze the C minor to the E flat right, we get one of my most favorite chords, the E flat six chord. So apparently there used to be a major chord, not a dominant seventh chord. And then I had to think about the transcription that I did on the Wes Montgomery solo. He's playing that beautiful E flat major 7 sharp 11 chord if you leave the melody the A and put the E flat major in the bass right major or 6 it really doesn't matter so much that explains his chord choice again so I love those chords they are just a very nice way of playing a 2-5 and now again if you take this chord and play it on the middle four strings then you can see we're back to our minor 7 shape right it's just the minor 7 
without the minor third, but eleven instead. And the E flat seven here. It's what I'm thinking. It's actually a D flat major chord, right? But then a D flat major sharp eleven with the E flat in the bass. There are lots of variations on this dominant 7th chord. It's really used a lot. If you don't know it, write it down or try it out. It's really great. So like this, it would be E flat 7, 9, 13. Or even E flat 7, flat 9, 13. But also sometimes you find the root here. And then you can easily connect it to this chord. So that's that. Chord, right moving down to the A minor there's the E flat and then there's the D7 and you know you can always use the two chord with any dominant seventh chord that you're playing that's exactly what's happening here and then very often there's a D7 sus4 in the beginning so you can create a sus chord with a C major triad or also with this chord, which is actually a drop 2 C major 7 chord over the D. So he's basically transforming the D7 into a D7 sus4 chord. You could also be thinking A minor 7 with a D in the bass. Just to have a little bit more movement on two bars of D7. So speaking of movement, he's also starting a three note displacement here. You can think about that rhythm as a eight note and a quarter note that repeats itself and sort of creates extra movement through the bar, like a mini waltz if you want to. Plus on top he is not only playing a D7, but he's playing D7, E flat 7 in a very well disguised way. So starting again on the sus4. <laughs> This is a D7, right? You could also be thinking that's an F sharp minor 7 chord. Back to our chord, but then you just lower this note. Which gives you a half diminished chord on the third degree of the D7. So very often we have upper structure chords on the third of a chord because we don't always need to play the bass note especially if there's a bass player, but also if you're on your own and you already made clear which kind of sound you're creating, the ear sort of remembers where you're coming from. And if you're analyzing this chord to the D, it's a D7-9 chord. So he's shifting that up and down, and that's just E flat 7, D7. Like 5 1, right? A7, D7, but then playing the triton substitution of the A7. That would be the E flat 7. And this in this three note displacement, so it's really cool. E flat 7, D7, E flat 7, 9, D7. So those three notes you can. It's really like a C major triad, right? With the flat 7. But then here, and here again, that's actually E flat 7, D7 again, but with a flat 9. So you're thinking E flat 7, right? Flat 9, 5. And then you have the diminished chord, and I know they only written the name of the diminished chords, but basically, if you're thinking E flat 7, flat 9, D7, D7 flat 9, it makes a lot of sense. So again, it's really like. E flat 7, D7, E flat 7, D7, E flat 7, flat 9 to the G minor. So this gives us a really strong point of resolution thanks to the flat 9. It targets even more the G minor chord and now th something else is happening. So he's using the B flat triad and the C triad. Both triads stem from the F major key. They are on the fourth and fifth degree, right? And 
you can always use the triads of the fourth and fifth degree of each key and then play a pedal and then you get the mode of that key. So if you're playing B flat and C and you're having a G pedal, then you're getting a Dorian sound. But if you're having an A pedal, you're getting a Phrygian sound. But in this case, he's just harmonizing the G Dorian scale. And with those triads, which is beautiful and sort of light, I find. And then here again, thinking of the G minor triad, sort of ignoring every rule about voice leading and just the bottom stays the same. Resolving it again to the triads. So that's beautiful. He's playing a motif in his chordal improvisation, right? On G minor, remembering that and concluding the next phrase also with those triads, which I really like a lot. And then. This is all for minor, right? We are in F major and then there's the B flat minor chord. Let's look how he harmonizes this chord. So this chord again, played on another string pair, would be the chord from the beginning of the tune, a D flat major 7. The D flat is the minor third of the B flat. Chord, right? So it's another upper structure voicing, very, very commonly used. And if you analyze it to the B flat in the bass, if minor third, flat seven, nine, five. So this chord, again playing it on another string pair, is an F minor seven, and he's harmonizing the E flat of the scale with the F minor seven. And I'm thinking it just gives sort of a B flat minor 7 sus sound with the 11 and the 9. So if you're playing F minor chord back to this shape and then have the B flat as a root, it doesn't sound so bad, right? We have the 5, the 9, the 11, and the flat 7. Just B flat minor 7. Again, a D flat major 7 chord, right? The same that we already had with the C major, just a half note higher. So the same trick playing the major 7 chord on the 3rd. We have that half diminished chord that we can sort of create from this shape, right, just lowering E flat 7 9, E flat 7 9, again. Resolving it to the F major chord, right, and just to give it a little bit more emphasis, I guess he's playing two F major shapes. This is actually F major drop three voicing. So the next four bars are sort of a pain in the ass because in many books you have like A minor 7, D minor 7, G minor 7, C7. So the common jazz musician is a little bit uh, unsatisfied because there are no two fives and there are no five ones that give them a little push and so they created most of the time for themselves and if we look at the bar so this chord is actually a C diminished chord but if we circle it back to the C half diminished chord right coming from the C sharp minor half diminished and put the A in the bass an A7 flat 9 chord leading to the D minor chord 
in this case with the G, transforming the D minor, our famous shape to the D minor with the G on top. So it's basically a little 5-1, right? It's, he's building a secondary dominant for the sake of movement. And here is doing more or less the same thing. He's starting on the D minor. Okay, you could also say D7 sus4 chord. But here's the minor trolled. And transforming it into a D7. 13, 9, right? D7 augmented. G minus 7, 11. So this, I particularly, is so beautiful. So look. And then. So moving, parallel voices are moving. I like that a lot. And then just A flat minor leading into the G minor. So he's basically playing F major 7, A7 to D minor, D7 leading to G minor. And then instead of playing the C7, he is playing an E half diminished A7, which is very beautiful. So I'm going to play it for you. E half diminished. So he's not substituting anything here, he's just playing different changes. And I guess that's my favorite part here. He's playing a D half diminished chord instead of a D minor chord. It sounds so beautiful. So, and of course, this chord could also be understood as an F minor chord. So I'm kind of uh, spacing out here a little bit, but if you're thinking about the fact that the tune is in F major and it gives the feeling you would be in F minor, sort of, that's a thing that happens often in jazz standards. So you could basically think about that passage as F minor 6, 9, going to B flat 7, 9, sharp 11. So he's moving on playing this really cool G7 sharp 11. It's on the second degree, right? We are in F major. Nothing special to have a sharp 11 on a dominant seventh chord on the second degree. This little movement is really like D minor 7, G7, right? You would be playing your shell voicings. Just skip the root. And then G7, 9, 13, and it's triton substitution. That's a D flat 9, just moving chromatically into the C7. Because anyways, we're playing a 2, 5, 1 at the moment, G minus 7, C7, going to F major. So I'm going to play the very cool G7 again. So this is very much a Wes Montgomery style. I'm thinking about it as 1-5-1. One, one. I'm thinking about this chord. It's a C7-9, but I could also say it's a G minor 6. D7 flat 9. G minor 7, right? That's again. D7 flat 9 stemming from this. Drop two voicing. G minor 7-9. Again, right? Major 7 chord on the flat third. So that sounds very cool and it's a very nice way of harmonizing a Dorian scale. And then this A flat minor 7 moves into the G minor. And the, then he does the same thing again with the triads, um, sort of building a Dorian sound. Another way of harmonizing a scale. And this chord is like really a very beautiful C7913 chord. You could think that it's stemming from that E half diminished chord. Right? We had that with that half diminished on the third. 
with the E flat going to the D7. So in this case it's nothing else. But the G is going to be an A. And that gives us the 13 on the C7. And here again he just leaves all those voices where they are and only move the upper voice. The one to the flat nine. The flat nine is always very strongly pulling to the tonic and it also gives us the C7 13 flat nine chord. Resolving it to the tonic again the F6 9 chord and an F major 7 chord. It's this, this shape, right? But on another string pair. And I think Joe Pass really likes to make a clear tonic sound. He's using two chords and I think that's also a very good idea if you're playing your lines that you're making a very clear tonic sound and then you can do whatever you want to in between. And a last word about lines. Don't forget if you're checking out all those chords, all those things that you can learn about harmonizing a melodies, of course you can apply it to your improvisation. So the next time you're going to have to play a dominant seventh chord for four bars, let's say a D7. And we talked about this trick with the chromatic movement and the three note displacement as well. You could be thinking about playing E flat 7, D7 arpeggio for example over those long stretches of a dominant seventh chord. So just to add a little bit more movement and that's just one of the many things that you can use and I really hope I could help you get your guitar out, try to play this etude. The whole book is great, there's so many cool things in it and yes. Have a nice week. I see you next week. Bye.